So um, uh, please uh, join us for the entire process. It's, we really want you to have the full experience of all three projects together. And then we hope to see you later because we have two studio visits tonight, one at 6.30, one at 8 o'clock. Those are experiences for you to see exciting new work and dig deep into their process uh, by hearing from the artists on how they make their work and also see critical response from, uh, from uh, invited guests uh, who are responding to the work. And then we also have uh, new dramaturgies. Birdie Frickman tonight will be sharing some uh, of her research. So we have lots of things going on tonight. We hope to see you. And then all day tomorrow we have tons of activity. Look in your books. Uh, but right now I'm going to see uh, the stage to Nikki Douglas.
Dear Heavenly Father, <laughs> we have come to humbly offer our tithes and offerings on this beautiful, bountiful, boisterous day. We pray, Lord, that with these offerings, you, you bless our lives, Lord, and continue to cover us with your grace. <laughs>
uh, lineup today, and I'm going to be sharing part of my story called Please Google Ukraine. Oh, this is my life, that is <laughs> Thank you. Um, and before I start, I just want to take a moment to thank the Prelude Festival for existing. This is a terrific celebration of the in uh, New York, and I hope you all get to see tons and tons of really good theater this weekend at the festival. So, long live Prelude Festival. Now, my name is uh, Artem. Mm -hmm. Here we go. My thumbs are not as strong as they used to be. There we go. Artem. Uh, my name is Artem. Some people say Artem. Artem, Artem. Either is fine. Uh, but before we get going, I would just really love to hear if you all have a preference. Um, so can I see a show of hands for who likes Artem? Okay, okay, very interesting, very interesting. Uh, can I see uh, Artem? People for Artem? Oh, yeah. <laughs> can I see the Artem hands one more time, please? Yeah, okay, yeah, we've got some people crossing over here. <laughs> Where are my Artem people at, though? Where are you at? Ooh. I prefer Artem. <laughs> uh, that's okay, don't make yourself, don't feel bad. Uh, Artem is just only the American version of my actual name, which is Artyom. Yes, and uh, that is the Russian version of my Ukrainian name, which is Artem. So, Artem, 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 just never fucking art, please. Thank you. Why am I telling you about me? Because, see, I've been thinking a lot about my identity, and that's what really made me want to write down this story. And, uh, yes, by the way, this is just a story. Anybody who's expecting a play, I'm so sorry to disappoint you. I don't think everybody likes stories. This is just my story. And since I started sharing this story, I've been really overwhelmed with how many things people respond about this story. And I do agree, the story is about a lot of things, but to me it's primarily about one thing, or primarily one place, Ukraine. Now, all of you incredibly gorgeous human beings, seated here right now at the Prelude 2018 Festival, which is happening at the CUNY Graduate Center, which is located in the one only city that never sleeps, New York City, which is inside the United States of America, what is your relationship to Ukraine is probably a question you don't really ask yourself very often. <laughs> but for the next 10 minutes that we have together, I invite you all to indulge yourself in this fantasy you didn't know you had until now. And I welcome you to ask yourselves, what does Ukraine mean to me? Now, one little disclaimer. To protect the identities of real people, and to tell the story of this place as truthfully as I can, I have fictionalized a few details. Now, let us begin for real. Every time I tell the story, pardon me. Every time I tell this story, uh, I start the same exact way because this story has a very classic beginning. We begin on the banks of the river. The time is the late afternoon, just about an hour before dinner, and it's not around now, but about now. And today, this day, is Thanksgiving. I'm sitting on a bench on a bridge overlooking a huge river. Pine trees pierce the skies along the banks, and birches crown the beaches, and somewhere in the distance, a solitary, melancholy willow tree is dipping its this is the Dnieper River, and the Dnieper River runs through the middle of a town called Kiev, which happens to be the capital of a country called Ukraine. And right there, you can watch the Dnieper River cut the country right down the middle. From the Black Sea, you can watch the Dnieper River run up the middle, and it goes right through our neighbor to the north, Belarus, and then it keeps going further on still to the westernmost parts of Russia. Now as I'm sitting here overlooking the Dnieper River, I'm reading a text message on my cell phone. The year is 2014. Oh, by the way, if you'd like to see pictures of uh, the Dnieper River, or Kiev, or Ukraine, or any of the things that I'm talking about today, um, I strongly recommend you Google it. <laughs> Please Google Ukraine. Um, I can only tell you the basics. I was born in 1985, when at the time, Kiev was the capital of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine, which is part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, better known as the USSR. And by the time I turn six, the USSR falls apart, Ukraine becomes an independent nation. 
When I'm 10 years old, my family finds out that we have won a green card lottery to come to the United States of America. And shortly after I turn 11, <coughs> later, a week after I turn 11, my father, my sister, my, uh, my mother, and I all together emigrate to the United States. We arrive and we settle in New Jersey. So now, almost 20 years later, I'm back in Cuba, I'm back in Ukraine, and I'm overlooking the neighborhood, and I'm reading a text message from my mother. Now, just from where I'm sitting, to uh, overlooking the neighborhood, river, just two miles away, is the central plaza town called Lightdown Mesolevity, or Independence Square. It's this vast, wide <coughs> open area that reminds me of Red Army Plaza down in Brooklyn, but it's got the distinct feel and noisiness of Times Square. Now, right here, in the Maidan, over the winter of 2013 into the winter of 2014, what started out as peaceful pro-European Union uh, demonstrations turned into riots when private police and regular police brutally beat, fired upon, and murdered peaceful civilians right in the streets. In fact, over the course of that winter, the riots became so savage that they quickly earned the name of the Maidan Revolution. And during the revolution, the Maidan was literally set on fire. You can Google a little thumbs up and find a whole slew of Maidan Revolution images. But by March, the revolution is resolved, and the results are that the president of Ukraine is impeached and is charged with committing war atrocities against his own citizens, but before he can be arrested, tried, and sentenced, he flees in the middle of the night to his homeland, which happens to be Russia, where he's given full asylum. Now, just around the time the Maidan is wrapping up, Russia pops up again and annexes the autonomous region of Crimea. Crimea, which is a peninsula that juts out into the Black Sea. Uh, Crimea, which is the southernmost point of Ukraine. Crimea, which is actually pronounced Krim. But sure, why not? Crimea. <laughs> <laughs> Crimea, which is one of 25 states of Ukraine, and annex, which is a uh, fancy word for a hostile takeover. Immediately following the annexation of uh, Crimea, Two more states, the eastern state of Lunas and the southern neighbor Donetsk, proclaim themselves independent people's republics. And then they band together to form one brand new super state, which at the time they called Novorossiya. The creation of Novorossiya, who pledges their allegiance to Russia, throws Ukraine into a civil war. So the Dnieper River cuts our country in half. The West is all pro-Europe, pro-European Union, the East is all pro a new Russia. And that's a significant thing. The East isn't pro a new Ukraine. It's pro a new Russia. It's literally in the name. Nova Russia. Nova New Russia Russia. So, Kiev and Maidan are set on fire. Crimea, Luhansk, Donetsk, three of the 25 states are not actively changing their Ukrainian identity, possibly erasing it altogether. And at this point, it's only April 2014, so all of this has happened in less than six months. In May 2014, uh, pro-European supporters are chased down the street in Odessa in a trap inside a trade union's house. The building is locked from the outside, the building is set on fire, and the people are burned alive. In June 2014, don't really know what happened in June 2014, sorry. Um, in July 2014, <laughs> my uncle is forced to leave his home in the Donetsk state, and he has to flee the country altogether, leaving behind a uh, place where he was born, where he grew up, where he raised a family, uh, where he served as a civil worker for over 40 years, and to add it still to injury, just a week after he flees his home, his entire town is bound down by areas when the Ukrainian army tries to drive out the invading Novorossiya troops. And then on August 3rd, 2014, my 29th birthday, my brilliant and beautiful mother sends me a text message. And this text message reads, now, there is no home for us anywhere. Just out of the blue, just, hey, you should know. She's telling me with this text message that after almost 20 years in the States, the US is still not our home, but now, neither is Ukraine. She doesn't say there's no home for her. She says, us. Now, there's no home for us anywhere. Would you all like to see what my gun looked like after the revolution? Now there is no hope for us anywhere. I keep reading this text message over and over and over and over again. Until finally, when I get ready for work that year on Thanksgiving holiday, I go back to Kiev to see my birthplace for myself. So now that I'm back in Ukraine, I'm back in Kiev, <coughs> and I'm overlooking the Dnieper River, I realize that I've come all the 
this way to say goodbye to Ukraine. Ukraine has become an absentee parent. The kind that pops up once in a while just to remind you where you're from, and then it bothers my mother. Ukraine stresses my mother out. Ukraine makes my mother text me crazy things in the middle of the night, but now there's no home for us anywhere. So I'm here on behalf of my family now to say goodbye to Ukraine before it changes and becomes something we don't recognize anymore. I'm here right now, in 2014, to say goodbye, just in case, you know, just in case, let's say, in 10 years, Ukraine as a country disappears. And I get a tap on my shoulder. It's Simone. Simone is 16 years old. Simone goes to high school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She's about this tall, and she has kind of like a lean hungry look about it. Like, very uncomfortable. Um, she also has this faint of jet black hair that just seems to just like fall out of the back of her skull. And her eyes are also jet black. Her eyes are that special shade of uh, soulless, I'm only happy when it rains, tint of teenager. Just <laughs> pure darkness. Simone is my wife's youngest sister. And ever since my wife and I got together, Simone has always been there. Her and I talk all the time. She really looks up to me. I kind of adopt her as my niece. None of which explains what are you doing here, Simone? She says, I haven't eaten in 24 hours. What? Simone is on a study abroad high school scholarship to Prague, because Cambridge, Massachusetts got it like that. And for less than 20 hours, she has been traveling from Prague to Kiev with a faint ID to catch up to me. She's skipping Thanksgiving back in the States. Just a surprise. And she's tracked me down thanks to Instagram. <laughs> Why? Simone? She says, because I want to record your journey. Oh, would you like to Instagram the Ukrainian Civil War, Simone? No, she says.
achieve here is to make Mars seem possible, uh, make it seem as though it's something that we can do in our lifetimes, um, and that you can go. And, and is there really a way that, that anyone can go if they wanted to? I think that's, that's really the important thing. So, Multi-planetary. <laughs> 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 
on the moon because it's much smaller than being a planet. It doesn't have any atmosphere, it's not as resource rich as Mars, it's got a 28 day day. Whereas the Mars day, 24 and a half hours. And in general, Mars is far better suited to ultimately scale up to become a self-sustaining civilization. Well, just to give you some comparison between the two planets, they're actually remarkably close in a lot of ways. In fact, we now believe that early Mars was a lot like Earth. And in fact, if we could just warm Mars up, we would once again have a thick, thick atmosphere and liquid oceans. But where things are now, we're about a half a day as far from the sun as Earth, so still decent sunlight. It's a little cold, but we could warm it up. <laughs> Has a very helpful atmosphere, where in the case of Mars being primarily CO2, Western nitrogen, argon, and a few other trace elements, means we can grow plants on Mars. <laughs> Just by compressing the atmosphere. <laughs> and it has nitrogen too, which is also incredibly helpful for growing plants. It'd be quite fun to be on Mars. Because you have gravity, which is about 37% that of Earth. So you could like just lift heavy things and like bound around and like have a lot of fun. <laughs> Currently, we have seven billion people on Earth. And zero on Mars. <laughs> the issue that we have today. Well, in fact, the issue that we have today is that there is no way to go to Mars. In fact, you cannot go to Mars for infinite money. <laughs> you using traditional methods. You know, we're taking an Apollo-style approach. An optimistic cost number would be about $10 billion a person. So the Apollo program, and the cost estimates are around $100 billion to $200 billion in current year dollars. And we sent 12 people to the surface of the moon, which was an incredible thing. And probably one of the greatest achievements of humanity, but that's a steep price to pay for a ticket. That's why these circles only barely just touch. So you can't create a self-sustaining civilization if the ticket price is $10 billion. What we need is to move these circles closer together. <laughs> and if we could cut the cost of moving to Mars to be roughly the median house price in the U.S., which is $200,000, <laughs> then I think the probability of establishing a self-sustaining civilization would be very high. I think it would almost certainly occur. <laughs> Not everyone would want to go. In fact, I think a relatively small number of people from Earth would want to go, but enough would want to go, and who could afford the ticket price that, you know, I think it would happen. It gets to the point where almost anyone, if there was, this was their goal and they saved up, they could ultimately save up enough money to buy a ticket and move to Mars. So, and John, well, oh, and Mars would not have a labor shortage for a long time, so jobs would not be in short supply, but I think it's a little difficult because we have to figure out how to improve the cost of moving to Mars by 5 million percent. <laughs> so, that's tricky. It's not easy. <laughs> and it sounds virtually impossible. But I think there's ways to do it.
gives you a sense of vehicles by performance. Sort of current and historic. I don't know if you can actually read that, but in expendable mode, the vehicle we're proposing would do about 550 tons. And in expendable mode, and in about 300 tons of reusable. That compares to Saturn V's max capability of 135 tons. But with the interplanetary system, which traditionally we've used for Mars, we've been able to, we believe, massively improve the design performance. So it's the first time a rocket sort of performance bar will actually exceed the physical size of the rocket. <laughs> this gives you a more sort of direct comparison. The thrust level is quite enormous. We're talking about lift-off thrust of 13,000 tons! <laughs> It will be quite tectonic when it takes off. We decided to start off the development with what we think of as probably the two most difficult elements of the design. And this is going to be the Raptor engine. It's going to be the highest chamber pressure engine of any kind we've ever built. And probably the highest thrust to weight. Oh, ooh. <laughs> it's a full blown combustion engine, which maximizes the theoretical momentum that you can get out of a given source fuel and oxidizer. We subcool the oxygen and methane to densify it. So, compared to when propellants are used closer to their boiling points in most rockets, in our case, they actually load the propellants closer to the freezing points, and that can result in a density improvement of up to around 10 to 12 percent, which makes an enormous difference in the actual results of the rocket. It gets rid of any capitation risk for the turbo pumps, and it makes it easier to feed a high-pressure turbo pump if you have very poor propellant. Oh, ooh. <laughs> so the rocket booster, in many ways, is really a scaled-up version of the Falcon 9 booster. You're going to see a lot of similarities, such as the, the grid fins, obviously clustering, a lot of engines at the base. And the big difference, really being at the primary structure, is advanced form carbon fiber. Ooh. And that it's, it's opposed to aluminum lithium. And we use autogenous pressurization. And we get rid of helium and nitrogen. <laughs> Oh, rest. 
restaurant. It'll be like really fun to go. You're going to have a great time. <laughs> is greater for a multi-planet species. Now that's the defensive argument. But the argument I find most compelling is that it would be an incredible adventure. I think it would be one of the most inspiring things that I can possibly imagine. And life needs to be more than just solving problems every day. You need to wake up and be excited about the future and be inspired, and want to live. Thank, thank you.
Can I throw a follow-up question onto that? Um, what does a for for all of you? What does a day in the in the life of the rehearsal process of this piece look like? How are you How are you rehearsing right now? Uh, well, for me, it started every morning with memorizing all of the verbatim speech, um, which is really hard because. Their verbatim isn't like a well-written play where the lines make sense as they go down. So there's a lot of back and forth and he repeats and stuff. So that, that was a big, huge part of my personal rehearsal process. And then for us, um, we did a development in August and then we started rehearsal with like, mm -hmm. And our rehearsals have been really um, non-typical of a traditional play or something because we're, we're literally we're just feeling out like we're feeling it out as we go every single rehearsal we find something new or something changes or we flip something so it was really like sort of more like sculpting and then maybe a little less people need to rehearse it but it's still being sculpted so. okay. um rehearsal process um, I can't, I, I want to first just say who these people are. So Star is one of my composers, or one of the composers of this piece, and so is Jerome. And then Paris and Yari are performers and like are alive in, in the work as well. Um, and uh, I sort of run rehearsal, there are a couple of modes that this piece operates under, right? There's dance, there is song that happens, and then there's like these moments of text. Um, and there's all of the moments in between. Um, and so technically, you know, we just do like an hour on dance, an hour on the other thing, an hour on the other thing. But as far as the feeling and the rehearsal vibe goes, sort of the energy around rehearsal, I'll, I'll just sort of pass the mic to to one of my collaborators here to be. Uh, <coughs> there's so much laughter in our rehearsals, um, and so much joy and ad-libbing and improvising. And because there's probably, there's like nine or 10 of us, at this point. Um, so there's a lot, and there's a lot of like, oh, I love what you did there. That was very right. Oh, that was good. Um, and, we, and I feel like a lot of us grew up in church, so we, we, we can recognize when it's authentic, when a certain, a certain phrasing or um, hallelujah is just authentic. Um, but there's, I would say the laughter is, is my favorite part. Artem, what about you? Yeah, so um, when I uh, when I first presented this piece at um, so this was this was a company in Brooklyn that I worked with called the Oye Group, and they did a festival that I was part of called the uh, Light like Festival two years ago, where I sort of presented the first iteration of this, and I had a director that I worked with, and it was you know it's it's sixty minutes of me talking, um, so there was just a lot of just finding simple ways to ground me and kind of make that a comfortable, accessible experience for an audience where they're not just hearing really like, when is this guy going to stop? Um, and then ever since my rehearsal process is, I like, I have like go-to albums that I brought on my headphones. I like go between, this is just a real in-depth look in my process. I like to on a Stranger Things soundtrack, or I put on Lemonade by Beyonce, and I just walk for hours just doing a show out loud. And the problem with phone is so, you know, we live in New York, so we're like, oh, it's just a person on their phone talking with the attitude about Ukraine. That's the that's um, are there Are there any questions from the audience? All the way back there? Uh, what is your research process like? Where do you, where do you find your sources? What's your research process like and where are your sources from? Um, that's the, the, the bulk of our process so far has been about research, and um, and there's a lot about space at the moment. And then there's also Elon Musk, I think, is trying to upstage us every day with sort of more outrageous behavior to, to pull attention away from playing the festival. So just sort of keeping up on the, on the news is kind of uh, with, with somebody like Elon Musk. Um, there's just a, there's a lot of interest both 
uh, you know, internationally and in the arts sort of thinking about um, the earth and the inhabitability of the earth. So uh, it's a kind of vast topic of research, and that's, that, that's sort of what we've been waiting through. And the, the geometry of this is multi-layered. Um, so, and I'll let the two of you sort of speak to how I came, to, uh, how I approached you about music, how it came, I can't. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, there, there are some research elements attached to how I'm interested in exploring music in this piece. I don't let them speak to that. Um, but what I will say in addition to that is that um, I'm reading a lot about religions and all sort of all religions, not just the ones that I know, the ones that I was raised inside of, and I'm reading about spirituality, and so I'm trying to um, in, inform, uh, introduce what I'm finding from that research. And then I'm also researching myself um, and asking for my collaborators to also do that sort of work to sort of to try to pinpoint where they, where they are at with their spirituality and how they were raised and to bring all of that information um, into her sort of. Yes, so Vicky um, sent text to Jerome and I and said, this is the text, please don't add anything or change it, um, write music. And I was like, oh, a container, how nice. Um, and yeah, literally, I. I just was coming through and I was like, I like this. And then I started playing around with some stuff and then there was a thing. Um, and as someone who grew up in the church singing a lot of hymns and gospel songs and things like that, the culture is very close. Um, and I, there was like a little bit of a um, like, can I just write something to these words? Which I like are in me so much in like such a specific way. Um, but because it is my culture, although I might not be steeped in it now, it has informed my life, especially as an artist, in the way that I write, the way I communicate, and what I think about um, art uh, as like a communal space. Um, a lot of that comes from being raised in the church. So I do have something to say about that now, and now I have a chance to. I just want to add that the text that I sent over to them is uh, are various Negro spirituals, um, the lyrics of those songs. But I attached no music because I wanted to be open, a little open. <laughs> it's my freedom making. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Hello. Um, I was really, um, it's an interesting question just because I find like that whole idea of inspiration and how to do research is kind of complicated because I wanted to do this in my own voice and so parts that are fictionalized I wanted to all of a sudden have um, you know I'm like in my group of friends I'm a designated foreigner so like whenever anything happens in with like you know in Russia or Ukraine they're like oh what's going on there and I'm like I'm not the textbook like I don't know you know what I mean and so I started kind of kind of the big part was just first responding to like how do I feel about this without any context? How do I feel about this thing that's in the news without any context, without really knowing where it came from, you know? So there was like this process of finding my own voice to respond to, and then there were, the, it just almost started to kind of fall in place where um, news that are current events, especially once they were like, what my family was being affected, it all became sort of these things like, oh, this is analogous to this. You know, like my uncle had to flee because this was happening. It's like a, just a strange way to piece together a history of a place that, like, you, you didn't think you had an interest in piecing together, as like as maybe like crappy as that sounds to say, but until something tragic happened, you know. So that's the, that's the process. I think we have time for one more question from the audience, right in the middle there. Um, could you speak uh, about the moment in the process where you said, I'm ready to show this to people? Do we want to switch out the order maybe a little bit? Someone else other than Andy and Janine go first? I, I can 
say something to that. Um, there was a point where this was like, a, I had these two friends that I shared the early script with these two, and by about an hour and a half into it, I was only a third of the way through. And um, it was very shocking to me to be like, oh, no, 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 there is, this is not going to work. And um, I then proceeded to have a, like a very erotic weekend. I got much too inebriated. And I started to skim off the things that were all about, like the thing I just mentioned, like, oh, I feel crappy that I don't know more about my country. Or this, I just started skimming off the things where I'm self-deprecating and like being negative to myself about something that isn't necessarily a part of my daily experience, and I shouldn't feel necessarily guilty about it. I should be motivated to investigate it. You know, I should be enthused to learn more. So everything that was like, oh, boo hoo, I don't fit in America, turned into how how can I um, how can I be a part of this culture and that culture together? So um, after I lost that and. I recovered from the, the, the hangover, I was feeling a bit more comfortable. I'm sure. I'm, if it were up to me, I, I, I wouldn't share anything in process. I am in a residence currently at Arsona, and the, some of the folks who manage that residency have been like, hey, you want to? Can we see some? Can, can you show it? Um, and so, because of that, I have. That was the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think that's like for us. It was like it's it's sort of backwards. It's like let's do prelude. Okay, then we should make some. You know, I'm show people. Um, so it was a weird. Was a really. Um, Conscious thought process of like now it's like you're gonna do this now. You need to go ready. You'll never you do it. So you have to give yourself these workshop presentations just to show. I mean, that we don't know if this will ever be in what we actually. I mean, maybe maybe will. But it's a good starting place. Well, I guess I mean I think that's a, a good uh, thing to wrap up on. Just to ask all of you um, quickly if there is a way that that any of us here want to, if, if we want to follow and see a, a fuller iteration of this work, there may not be a way for all of, us, for all of them yet that we know, but if, but if there is, can you tell us? How do we get to see this? I yeah, I mean, I know you don't have to I, yeah. You know, if you have a living room, I will come over and do the show. You. <laughs> that is what I'm on right now. I'm looking for living rooms, and I'm looking for not theatrical spaces to perform this at. Um, bars will suffice, um, cab coffee shops, I mean, the list goes on. Um, but that's what I'm planning right now, sort of a, a tour of neighborhood places and also just uh, domestic locations where I can just do this. Um, I will complete my residency at Arsenal in January, and so if you uh, want to ask me for my email address at the end of this, you can follow me that way, and I am not officially saying anything this moment, but if you were to look at the Shed's website in the spring, you might find some information about how to see this show. <laughs> also ask for email addresses. Uh, great. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing both your work and your process with us. Um, one more round of applause for everybody. with Bernie Bergman, and we will have a studio visit with Dan Safer uh, at 8 o'clock in the Seattle Center. So stick around all night with us, and thank you again to the artists. <laughs> Thank you.